Als, äh, als nächstes kommt Professor Henrik Svensmark vom Danish Space Research Institute. Henrik Svensmark ist bekannt geworden mit einer Arbeit von seinem... Äh, ja, genau. mit seinem Doktorvater äh, Egil Fries, ich kann seinen Namen nicht aussprechen, über die Wirkung von der Wolkenbildung, Cosmic Rays, was Nia Shaviv gerade äh, angezeigt hat, die Wolkenbildung als Folge von kosmischer Strahlung. Die, an der Stelle möchte ich noch mal äh, zwei Worte zum Thema Cancel Culture sagen. Die Forschung von Hendrik Svensmark ist seit einigen Jahren von offizieller Seite so gut wie auf Eis gelegt worden, weil seine Forschung halt nicht das offizielle Narrativ unterstützt. Wir haben im Rahmen unserer Möglichkeiten, dank Spender von Ihnen, Spenden von Ihnen, versucht hier einen Teil dieser Forschung weiter zu kofinanzieren, mit also mit jetzt immer noch bescheidenem ähm, Einfluss. Ergebnis. Und äh, also für den Fall, dass Sie wissen, wo noch die Forschungsanträge auszufüllen sind für weitere Forschung auf dem Gebiet Klima und nicht zwingend in Richtung Mainstream gehen soll, Anträge sind immer noch herzlich willkommen. Okay, uh, Henrik, we're looking forward to your presentation Thank about you. cosmic rays and uh, cloud formation. The clicker is over there. Okay, so all we need is the uh, presentation. Thank you very much for inviting me again. I think I've been to almost all uh, uh, these uh, conferences over the years, and uh, uh, we have been working on, on these ideas uh, for many years, so it's really uh, a big pleasure uh, to show you uh, some of these things uh, again. Uh, it is a collaboration. Uh, I am collaborating with one of my colleagues, which is Martin Enghoff. He is also at the DTU, the Technical University of Denmark. And then, of course, near Shaviv, we have been working together for, uh, well, I mean, exactly 20 years, uh, more or less now. Uh, and then my son, Jakob Svensmark, uh, and finally a, a, a postdoc, Irena, uh, which works with, uh, with Nia. So, I'm going to talk about the connection between cosmic rays uh, and clouds uh, and why we think there is such a connection. And uh, I'm going to give you the uh, sort of the basic idea uh, that we have been working on. Uh, and it, of course, involves what we call cosmic rays. So, I will show you uh, what cosmic rays uh, are in this context. Um, so... And then I will show you why they are important. Uh, and the whole idea, of course, has to do with uh, that they affect uh, Earth's cloudiness. And I will show you uh, some uh, results that actually indicate that this is the case. And then the final part uh, is uh, on these very long time scales that Nia also uh, talked about. Uh, and that is over millions of years. And I will show you some influence on life. And these are some uh, relatively new results uh, I'm going to show you. So, what are uh, supernovas? Well, uh, you see here uh, that in the Milky Way we have stars, large stars that explode and then they produce what we call a shock front. And the shock front accelerate particles to uh, enormous uh, energies and these particles are then moving through the uh, interstellar uh, space uh, and uh, some of them might actually go and get into our solar system and as they go into our solar system they meet what we call the heliosphere and the heliosphere uh, it contains the sun's magnetic field and this magnetic field it can actually screen against cosmic rays. That means that uh, in periods where you have high solar activity, more of these cosmic ray particles are sort of scattered back into uh, space and you will have a change in, co in cosmic rays. So what happens 
when the cosmic rays enters uh, into the atmosphere. So you imagine we have the atmosphere here and we have an incoming proton of uh, maybe 100 giga electron volts. And you see uh, you get this kind of shower structure. So one particle, instead of being just one particle because of the interaction with the atoms of the atmosphere, it can become two millions of particles that move down through uh, the atmosphere. Uh, and this is something that is happening uh, all the time. If you could see uh, these secondary particles, you will see that we were sitting in a constant uh, rain of particles uh, which are uh, in entering into the atmosphere uh, all the time. What is interesting is that these particles, they ionize the atmosphere uh, and uh, these ions are extremely important when we are going to talk about uh, the uh, effect on clouds. And another thing is that they produce new isotopes. So the energy is so high, so we produce, for instance, carbon-14, which everybody uh, has heard about. You use it for uh, dating uh, of archaeological uh, artifacts of various kinds. And some of this uh, slightly heavier carbon, it might go into uh, trees and end up in uh, tree rings. And then you can measure how much carbon-12 you have uh, in a in a carbon in a in a tree ring relative to carbon fourteen, and if you know that, you can say something about how active the sun was, how many cosmic rays entered into the Earth's uh, atmosphere. So, the interesting thing is that every time uh, you have a change in cosmic rays, you apparently have a change in Earth's climate. Uh, Nia showed you a, a number of um, of correlations on longer time scales. Here is just one example. So this is the temperature over the last thousand years, and you can see here we have the medieval warm period, then we have the little ice age, and then we have the modern warming. Uh, and uh, if you look down uh, at the bottom figure. Uh, you can see how solar activity is changing and you can see there is a nice correlation where you have uh, this is actually low solar activity during the uh, 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 little ice age and this corresponds uh, to an increase in cosmic rays so colder climate means more uh, cosmic rays then this is what we see all the time okay so the question is, what are cosmic rays doing to the atmosphere? And the idea that uh, we worked on very, very early was the idea that uh, if it's going to be an effective way of changing the Earth's climate or the energy budget of the Earth, uh, it should be clouds. And you can see from this uh, picture here, a beautiful uh, animation, uh, that. Uh, that, that you have clouds everywhere, and if you have a systematic change in these clouds, it will be a very effective way of changing the Earth's energy budget. You can see that the clouds, they cool uh, the Earth with about 20 to 30 watts per square meter. So if you have a systematic change in the Earth's cloudiness, it will be important for uh, uh, climate. And clouds is really the dark horse in any climate uh, assessment. Uh, this is the largest uncertainty in uh, understanding uh, climate change. Okay. So originally, whoops, we had this idea that it could be clouds, and this is uh, the, the the figure that also near uh, showed. So what, what you see here is a satellite data set from about 1983 until 2006. And uh, the red curve here is the change in cosmic rays. And this is measured by neutron monitors. So these are instrumental uh, measurements that we have here. And the blue curve is change in low clouds measured by this satellite data set, which is called ISKIP. Um, and the reason the data only goes to 2006 is because it is extremely difficult to have a calibrated system uh, because you have many satellites that has to be calibrated uh, and the changes that you're seeing are only <coughs> on the order of 2%. Of, of so it's very difficult 
to have such a system uh, calibrated. So after 2006, uh, there are problems with the calibration of this data set. So what we saw is a, an apparent correlation between the two. It doesn't explain what the physical uh, mechanism should be. So in order to understand how we sort of uh, uh, try to understand the, the connection between uh, cosmic rays and clouds, we have to look at how clouds actually are formed. So in order to form a cloud droplet, you have to have a surface on which water vapor can condense. And uh, this is given by what we call cloud condensation nuclei. They are on the order of 50 nanometers. That means that they are so small that you can't really see them. Uh, so if you have a, a, a nice clear day, um, you, 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 you won't be able to, to, I mean, even though you can see very long, uh, the, the air is actually filled with uh, these uh, particles. So um, they are always uh, present in some number. So if you go over the oceans, then the question is, how are these particles actually formed? I mean, how do they get into the atmosphere? And it turns out that uh, here they are produced by gases. So you have some gases with some molecules, and then the molecules stick together uh, and produce what we call a cluster. <clears throat> this cluster might be on the order of one nanometer. Um, and then over a week, this small cluster, it might grow uh, almost one million in size uh, or in the, in, in the mass uh, and become a cloud condensation nuclei. And the idea is that this ionization by cosmic rays, uh, it helps the stabilization of these small clusters. So if you have more ions, meaning more cosmic rays, you're producing more of these small uh, clusters, and if you have more of the small clusters, the idea was that then you get more cloud condensation nuclei. So that, that's the, 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 the basic idea. And it's very easy to see that if you change the number of cloud condensation nuclei, you change the cloud properties. So if you look here, this is satellite pictures um, of regions of the oceans. Uh, and you can see it regions with low clouds, and then you see these stripes. And these stripes are where ships have been passing. And as the ship sails, it pumps out a lot of aerosols. And some of these aerosols can actually be used as cloud condensation nuclei because they are quite big. And you see that uh, where they, uh, you have more cloud condensation nuclei, the microphysical properties of the clouds are uh, really changed quite a lot. You can see here they are much more white, so the reflection goes up. So if this can happen <clears throat> maybe in a smaller sense uh, globally because of cosmic rays, it would be a very effective way. So if you change the cloud condensation nuclei, you're changing cloud properties. Okay? <coughs> Sorry. So one of the things that uh, we did uh, was try to understand um, the, the microphysics, I mean, what is actually going on. And we developed things so much that we could test it uh, experimentally. And we have been doing, over the last uh, 10 years, or even more than 10 years, we have been doing experiments. Uh, we have been doing experiments at uh, the Technical University. We also started uh, with the CERN uh, experiment in Geneva. Uh, called the cloud uh, experiment. We also here uh, in a period did uh, experiments at an accelerator. So the accelerators are, are delivering uh, these energetic particles uh, that can ionize. Uh. And finally, we also had some period uh, where we were down in a mine, 1.1 uh, kilometer underground, and that was simply because we wanted to avoid cosmic rays. So you have to go almost one kilometer down in order to avoid the very energetic particle radiation. So all of these experiments, also the cloud experiment at CERN, they all get more or less the same result, which is as you increase the ionization, uh, 
then you produce more of these small uh, uh, aerosols or the small molecular clusters. They are on the order of three nanometers here. Uh, and you see, uh, as you increase the ionization in the chamber, you actually produce more of uh, uh, these co cosmic rays. So uh, one can say that uh, there is certainly a mechanism that is producing uh, these small uh, aerosols. So as I just mentioned before, this very small aerosol, it has to grow to a cloud condensation nuclei. So when we made uh, these uh, experiments and we got these results, uh, there were immediately groups that s started to uh, see if they could test these ideas in their global models, that is, in numerical uh, models. Um, and the thing is that if this little particle is somehow lost before it becomes a cloud condensation nuclei, then you can say there's no impact on clouds, and that will be the death of uh, this theory. So what did the, um, these large models uh, get? Well, <clears throat> um, th these results is actually, uh, I mean, these models have, have been producing results uh, more or less from 2009 and uh, until uh, I think one or two years back, th there were also some results and they're all the same. And let me show you uh, these uh, results. So what you have here is the size of the small aerosol. So here it's one nanometer, and then it's 10 nanometer and 100 nanometer. When it's in this range here, it can function as a cloud condensation nuclei. So what they did in these experiments, numerical experiments, is to <coughs> increase the number of small aerosols by maybe 5%, and then they look at the fate of these uh, particles. So if it's going to affect clouds, you would expect that they grow up uh, and end up, so you have uh, as many particles here as you have here, then you will have a direct effect from the ionization. But all these models are actually getting the result that as these particles grow, they disappear. So all of these particles, uh, there are so few surviving to cloud condensation nuclei, that they cannot affect clouds. And th that has been seen as a, a that, that, that was so, so seen as a, sort of the end of the theory. So, um, and, and this is also what you read in the IPCC report uh, today, that th this theory is not really working. Uh, and you can see that it has been in the media, uh, they have been very active to say that uh, this idea has very little, uh, uh, I mean, it does not work. Uh, so you can see it uh, here. So that looks pretty bad. But you have to remember, this is all in numerical models that you get these results. I will now show you what you get if you look at empirical results. So one of the things, uh, yeah, th this is the, uh, the end of the theory uh, that you had. So one of the things you can do is a, you can look at, uh, if you look here, this is the sun in the middle, and this is the earth that you have here. And what you see here is uh, solar activity where some plasma <coughs> from the sun is thrown out. And if this plasma hits uh, the earth here, you have one of the very, very strong event. If it hits the earth, it will make the cosmic rays go down within uh, hours uh, and it will stay down for a week or so. So this is how it looks. You can see here, then you have this explosion at the sun, you have this plasma hitting the earth, and then you're measuring the cosmic rays and it drops maybe by 30% uh, within some hours. Uh, and then over a week, it sort of uh, goes back uh, to more or less the same uh, level. So this is a natural experiment with the whole Earth. So we can then ask, is anything happening to the aerosols on Earth? Is anything happening uh, to the clouds? And what you see here is uh, different data sets. Um, so 
Let me explain. Here you have uh, day zero. This red curve is uh, the, the minimum in the cosmic rays. So this is 15 days before uh, the minimum, and this is 20 days after. <coughs> and what you see here is actually aerosols, and you see you have a drop in the aerosols following uh, this event. And then we have three different uh, satellite data sets looking at clouds. And you can see in all of these that you have a drop, uh, a, a quite significant drop, and there's a sort of a delay uh, every time. And this delay is simply because the small aerosols have to grow to become cloud condensation nuclei. And that takes uh, on the order of uh, five to seven days. So it all seems to be fitting very nicely. And the things uh, that we have been doing is also to look at the energy budget of the Earth. Um, so here you see the change in cosmic rays. So this is 15 days before. <clears throat> and then you have the drop in cosmic rays. So that gives you that this midline here is the minimum in cosmic rays. So what you have here is the latitude. So this is the equator. This is the South Pole and this is the North Pole. And then uh, you can see as the days goes on, then you have the minimum in the cosmic rays. And what you're looking at is uh, data from uh, what we call the Ceres uh, satellite of Ceres instrument, and it's measuring the net change in energy that goes into the Earth system. So you see there is a large effect uh, here on the order of two or three watts uh, per square meter. And if you look down here, you can see that most of it comes from what we call the short wave. So it means that more sunshine is coming down to the Earth's surface simply because there are fewer clouds. Uh, another thing you can see is that the effect is mostly on the southern part of uh, the Earth, in the southern hemisphere. And I can, uh, I mean, we can, I mean, here we see uh, the zonal uh, variations, but we can actually see it uh, globally in the next picture. So what you see here is a, is a, a map of the Earth. And what you have in this map is the change in shortwave uh, average over a week before uh, the uh, 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 minimum in the cosmic rays. And over here, it's the average in the week after the minimum. And you can see there's much more yellow uh, in this uh, uh, map over here. So, uh, and another thing you see, it's mainly over the oceans that this effect is strong. And uh, finally, because you have much more ocean in the southern hemisphere, it's also uh, mainly in the southern uh, hemisphere. So it's an indication that you would like to have fairly clean uh, conditions uh, in order for this mechanism uh, to work. So we spent uh, uh, actually four years trying to understand why these empirical results actually indicate that the mechanism is working and there's something wrong with these uh, models. And the, the whole idea is that the cosmic rays are helping stabilizing these small aerosols, that's for sure. But they're doing another thing. Uh, they are actually accelerating the growth uh, of these small uh, particles so they grow faster. And the reason that they're doing that is because uh, of these uh, interactions that there are, uh, what we can call them, are uh, enhanced interactions in the form of uh, Coulomb forces and mirror forces. So the mass of these small ions, they are actually interacting all the time with these particles. Uh, and because of these uh, increased uh, or enhanced uh, interactions, uh, they can actually accelerate the growth of the particles on the order of 10%. And that's extremely important because that makes more of these particles surviving to become cloud condensation nuclei. Okay, so that was more or less the background and how it, we believe it works uh, in, uh, with respect to the microphysics. Um, and what we have seen is that we have solar activity and it can modulate the cosmic rays on the order of 10%. And we have this 
cosmic ray cloud link, and it seems to be able to explain uh, many of the changes that we have had uh, over the last 10,000 years. And it will, of course, be important also in future climate because we have to understand uh, what the sun is doing in the future. And of course, it will help understanding the historic climate. So the last part, I want to uh, talk on completely different timescales now. Um, Nir just talked about uh, these uh, on geological timescales, that is when our solar system is moving through our Milky Way and we go in and out of regions where we have more or less star formation. And what I want to do is to show you that on these timescales from millions of years to billions of years, there are huge changes in climate. And these changes are so big that they've had a large influence on, on, on life uh, during uh, this uh, time. So, um, one of the things I'm going to, uh, I mean, one of the ways that what I have to do is try to reconstruct how uh, the cosmic rays has changed back in time. And one of the things that they, uh, one of the ways that I've been doing th that is by looking at what we call open stellar clusters. So um, what you have here is some gas and the gas collapses and that might produce a group of stars that are all bound by gravity and they're all produced from the same cloud. So these are all uh, sort of made at the, the same time. And this is uh, the, the seven sisters or Pleiades. Uh, this is one of these group of stars. And if you look in a radius of 3,000 light years, uh, you will have on the order of 1,000 of these uh, open stellar clusters. And from that, I can actually reproduce uh, the star formation. And when I have the star formation, I can say something about how much cosmic rays were produced as a function of time. And this is what you see here. So this is more or less the present time, and we go 500 million years back. And you can see you have this uh, variation. The variation is now on the order of 300%. So it's, uh, it's quite a lot. So uh, if we look now at the last 200 uh, million years uh, in this plot here, you can see the red curve is the change in, in uh, cosmic rays, uh, more or less. And then this blue curve and all the dots are reconstruction of temperatures. And you can see there is a very uh, nice correlation. The important part is that the changes in temperature is maybe uh, on the order of 10 degrees. So it's a change in climate uh, on the order of 10, 10 degrees, which is quite a lot. It's so, so much that it will be quite influential on uh, the biology or life uh, on Earth. So why is that? Well. Uh, one of the important things is uh, for life, if you look at life in the ocean, uh, is that you need a, a nutrients of various kinds, phosphor, iron, and nitrogen. Uh, and that is actually delivered by river runoff, and then it gets into the oceans. And then if you have a large mixing in the oceans, that means that you get a lot of nutrients delivered to the biological system. So if you have a lot of nutrients, it means you can have a larger biosphere. And if you have a large biosphere, it means that uh, you will also get more organic uh, sediments. And then there's another thing which is important. That is that uh, when you have a large biosphere, uh, well, life would rather uptake carbon-12 than carbon-13. 1% of the carbon is in the form of carbon-13. So if you have a large biosphere, it means that you have up to, that, that life has taken a lot of the carbon-12. That means that this ratio is changing. So by measuring this ratio in sediments, you can say something about how large the biosphere is and how much organic sediments were produced. So uh, this work uh, was, uh, published in uh, Geophysical Research Letters, and much to my surprise, it even made the front page of the, uh, of the uh, journal, as you can see here. 
Uh, so it looked as if uh, it were new times for the things uh, that we are doing, but I'm not so sure uh, anyhow. But it was very nice that it uh, made the front page uh, at that time. So it, it's uh, half a year ago. So the idea is that uh, if you have sedimentary mountains, uh, you can go here, this is Grand Canyon, uh, you can see all these layers here, and you go in and you measure this carbon-13 to carbon-12, um, and that says something about the fraction of organic material that is buried as uh, sediments. And what you see here is the change in cosmic rays from some different uh, data sets. Uh, so this is the change that we have over the last 500 million years. This is all astrophysics, right? So. What I'm showing you now is from these sediments, uh, which is geology, uh, and I will put it on top of this uh, figure here. And you can see there is a remarkable uh, correlation over uh, this period, indicating that the supernovas and the cosmic rays have had an enormous influence on conditions uh, here on Earth. So, the thing is that uh, when we have a large bioproductivity, we have a large fraction of organic material that is buried. And that corresponds to a high cosmic ray flux simply because you are delivering nutrients to the, uh, to this, to the uh, biosphere. Uh, whereas if you have a low cosmic ray flux, you, you are not really delivering very much uh, a nutrients and the biosphere necessarily is smaller and you get uh, less uh, organic material buried uh, in sediments. So this is the last 500 million years. It turns out that you can actually uh, extend time back almost uh, three and a half billion years. So what you see here is the star formation in the Milky Way. Uh, this is 3.5 million years uh, back. <clears throat> and you can see that uh, there was sort of a peak here uh, for about two billion years ago. Then there was a, a minimum for almost a billion years, and then you have things going up and down. We have just looked at this part here, where you see this is now, and then we had a minimum and a maximum, uh, and then we go further back uh, in time. So from sediments going that far back, you can also get the carbon-13 to carbon-12 and get the fraction of organic matter uh, in sediments, and this is the curve that you get. And you see that you have this maximum here, you have this period where not so much is happening, and then you have this uh, a movement up and down. You see this beautiful correlation. You also see that glaciations are fitting fairly well when you have a high cosmic rays, yet when you have uh, large ice ages uh, during this uh, uh, time. So. There is another thing about when you bury organic matter, and that has to do with the production of oxygen. So you have had a photosynthesis for almost uh, three and a half billion years uh, back. And uh, usually, I mean, the way that works is that you have some CO2 that combines with water, and that gives you glucose. Uh, uh, and uh, then you have some free oxygen. But if uh, you tend this organic matter, you just leave it on the surface of the Earth, uh, then the reaction will go the back again. That means that uh, the oxygen will disappear, uh, and there will be no net production of oxygen. In order to produce oxygen, you have to take this carbon here and bury it as organic matter in sediments then you get oxygen to the atmosphere, or you get oxygen into the ocean. So this curve here, with the fraction of uh, organic matter, is really also the production curve of oxygen over this period of time. So if this is true, that means that supernova has really helped the production of oxygen uh, and we all know that oxygen is needed for the evolution of complex life. So, all of a sudden, uh, the, the whole evolution uh, seems to be uh, connected uh, to uh, things which has to do with our uh, uh, Milky Way. 
So the question uh, is, why do we have these large peaks here? Because these are not spiral arms uh, changes. These are uh, something else. And it turns out that uh, that might actually be because of interactions of our Milky Way with what we call dwarf uh, galaxy. There is one called Sagittarius uh, dwarf galaxy. Uh, so if we are, we are over here and we look towards the galactic center, so just below the galactic plane, you can see this Sagittarius dwarf galaxy. And if you calculate its orbit, you can see that it has interacted with our Milky Way. Uh, so if we look here, uh, we can see between five, uh, uh, between six and, and maybe five uh, billion years ago, there was uh, a very strong interaction and you produced a lot of uh, stars and maybe our, our solar system was produced because of this interaction. But then if we go here, you can see there are some interactions, uh, further interactions, and you see these starbursts uh, here, uh, and they fit very nicely with the two maximum I just showed you. So, let me conclude. Um, it seems as if uh, variations in cosmic rays are associated with changes in the Earth's climate, and we have really strong empirical evidence on nearly all time scales. And the idea that we've been working on is that clouds are important. Uh, it's an important link uh, uh, between uh, or two co cosmic rays variations. And we sort of divided it into solar activity, uh, which affect uh, from days to you know 10,000 10, years, that is over the Holocene period, you see these beautiful correlations. And with the supernova activity, we see it over millions of years. And the last part was that the bar I mean, when we put uh, organic matter, uh, th this organic matter seems to follow variations in this supernova history. And it is uh, the source of oxygen and therefore uh, fundamental for the uh, evolution of complex life. So if these things are correct, uh, it seems as if this mechanism that we are talking about uh, might be one of the most important mechanisms in the total history uh, of the Earth. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I think you don't need it. I would like to ask in English um, first. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. I'm um, interested in your work, although I'm, I'm a lay person to that kind of research, and so I have, maybe I have a naive question. Um, you, it concerns a small time scale, about 20, 30, 40 years. In the publications, in the time series of the German Weather Organization, um, you can look up the sunshine, uh, the hours of sunshine, and this is almost steadily increasing for the, has, has been increasing for the last 30, 40 years, and I don't see any 11 year uh, cycle in it. Um, and I think that applies also to Switzerland, uh, Austria, maybe Denmark, Central Europe, and it's present in winter as well as in summer. Do you have any idea what may be the cause of this increase in sunshine hours? Well, I mean, the, the, the solar cycle variations is something that Nier uh, actually worked on, uh, and he showed some figures where you saw that the energy that goes in and out of the oceans uh, is, has this 11-year cycle and it's almost a factor of 10 larger than what you would expect from solar irradiance. Uh, and I'm pr pretty sure you also see, uh, I mean, you, you have done some work where you actually see solar cycle variations in the temperature data, right? Well, you, you see the temperature data, but... <clears throat> okay, so but over land, over land, you don't expect to see a large effect of the sun because, uh, as uh, Henrik showed, most of the effects uh, we see is over uh, the oceans. Um, so over the land, you have other effects which are uh, dominant. Uh, you also see in the global temperature uh, is the 11 year solar cycle, but again, as I mentioned, because of the large heat capacity of the oceans, uh, it's relatively damp. So the temperature variations, the global variations in the temperature are of order 0.1 degree, which might not sound large, but it's huge actually. 
could you say something about um, chemtrails? Is there any is there any um, effect of chemtrails in the clouds? Of of, of any effect of what? Of chem chemtrails. Chemtrails? No, I I I haven't noticed any of that. Have you? So geo geoengineering? No, not at all. Um, I appreciate your work because I'm following this uh, astronomic investigations since many years, but I have some concerns about your remarks about the glaciation of the Antarctis, Antarctica, because from the geological point of view, we know that the glaciation has taken place about 20 million years ago with the sinking of the land bridges and the thermic isolation of the Antarctica by ocean currents which are surrounding anticlockwise this frozen continent. So I'm a little bit doubtful about your explanations, what you showed about in the neogene in the territory times. Maybe you can say something. I, I can certainly say something. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think the glaciation, uh, according to a lot of these data, is around 34 million years ago. And uh, there are various ideas of why it glaciated. What I have shown is, uh, or what we have shown, is that, uh, that it coincides beautifully uh, with the changes uh, in, uh, in cosmic rays over this period. And it, when you had the glaciations, you had uh, first uh, a glaciation, and then uh, it, it started to melt. Uh, and then it re-glaciated, and you actually see this uh, in, in, in the reconstruction, you, you see this uh, effect uh, in the uh, supernova uh, reconstruction. It could be uh, accidental, uh, but at least it, it seems to be consistent. And I know that there are ideas uh, about uh, these, the straight uh, opening, so you have these uh, currents going around, and that's also part of the, uh, that's one, uh, idea of explaining why Antarctica uh, glaciated. So, we will see. If we fly in polar regions, we very often have aurora borealis. Is that a visual uh, thing uh, of, this, of this effect? Can you st mm -hmm. say something about it? The aurora uh, is not really directly related because the aurora that we see uh, is basically due to uh, high uh, energy particles coming from the sun, which are actually low energy compared to the cosmic rays. Um, we are talking about particles which are at most a few hundred MeV coming from uh, the sun, and because they are relatively low energy, uh, they are funneled uh, through Earth's magnetic field towards the poles, and then they are stopped at a height of typically 100, 150 kilometers. Uh, they ionize the nitrogen and oxygen, and when you get the recombination, you see the beautiful aurora. Uh, the cosmic rays come at energies which are uh, much larger. We're talking not about 100 MeV, but at uh, 10 or 100 GeV, so it's 1,000 times uh, more energetic, or 100 times, 1,000 times more energetic. Um, and this... Uh, higher energy particles uh, affect the atmosphere at uh, lower altitudes. Also, Sie können die Fragen auch gerne auf Deutsch sprechen. Das wird hier alles gedolmetscht. Also, das muss nicht auf Englisch sein. Haben wir es geschafft? Okay, dann thanks a lot, Nils. Thanks, Henrik.